Good morning. My name is Daryl Dash, and I am a church planter in uh, Toronto, and I am so privileged to be with you these next three weeks. I want to tell you, I, I pray for you often. This is one of my church homes away from home. I love your pastor and April, and uh, I just think the world of them, and I pray for you as well, so it's, I'm just so glad to be here, so thank you for having me today. And if you have your Bible, I'd invite you to turn to Psalm 1 today. As we're turning to Psalm 1, I want to tell you something that you probably already know, but you may have forgotten, and it's this. Your brain is amazing. It really is. Your brain is amazing. I don't know how they figured this out. I kind of do, but I don't want to think about it too much. Your brain only weighs three pounds, and it is a spongy mixture of water and fat and protein. And it's amazing. It is the most complex known structure, bar none. They've never found anything more complex than the human brain. Your brain contains billions of cells, approximately 100 billion neurons. Think about that, 100 billion neurons. Information passes through your brain at a rate of up to 250 miles per hour. The brain presents, it builds an image of the world from photons and electrons, light and dark, molecules in motion. And it makes you who you are. It connects you with what you remember, what you need, and what you want. They say that your brain is not just a supercomputer, but a collection of computers. And it handles all your cognitive processes, your stories, your, it stores memories, and it is a seat of your emotions. It is amazing. Because of the human brain, we've been able to invent the wheel, the uh, design semiconductors, build pyramids, paint the Sistine Chapel, compose symphonies, and land on the moon. Despite all the research that's going on, we still are barely scratching the surface of our knowledge of the brain. And it's clear, if we're going to live well in this life, we really need to handle our brains well. Because the brain is so important, it is crucial that we steward this resource well. But here's what I'm going to argue this morning. It has never been harder to do that. Our brains are under relentless attack. And you might think that I'm overstating that a little bit. A uh, guy, I don't think he's a believer, his name is Cal Newport, he's written a number of books, and uh, Cal Newport writes that about something called brain hacking. Now that sounds sort of sinister, doesn't it? But it happens every single day. Social media companies, I'm not saying they're evil or anything like that, but uh, they know how to manipulate behavior. Uh, they have people on staff who know how to basically get us hooked on their product. And it works, doesn't it? I am uh, checking online, and I see one of you liked one of my status updates, and I get this buzz in my head. It's a dopamine hit. It's a pleasure hit. Now, they've done studies on rats, and we're not rats. I get that. But they found with rats that dopamine is so powerful in rats' brains that they will, a rat will choose a dopamine hit over food or sex. In fact, a, a rat will go over an electrified grid, getting painful shocks with each step to get it. The the rat is so hooked on that little burst of pleasure in the brain that the rat will even endure pain to get it. Aren't you so glad that we're so much better than rats? I went out one day with my wife, uh, and uh, we went to a concert. It was an amazing concert. I forgot my phone at home. And I go there, and... At the beginning of the concert, a world-class musician, they say, okay, everyone turn your phones off. You don't need them. Tonight, you're in the presence of true art. Just sit back and enjoy it. They dim the lights. It was amazing. And I was sitting on the balcony, and I was watching down, and I see these little glows of light. And I'm like, what is wrong with these people? Of course, I, I could be smug because I didn't even have the option, right? I'd forgotten the phone at home. I probably would have been just like them if I were 
uh, if I had my phone. Well, later on, the concert ended. It was amazing. And my wife, I had to wait for her for a few minutes. And I was amazed in the three minutes I had to wait for her how many times I reached in my pocket to try to find my phone. Now, what I'm not saying today is that phones are evil, that social media is a conspiracy. I'm not saying any of that. But what I'm saying is we, have, we, have, we face realities in our life. We face the temptation to get distracted like no other generation before us. We are the most distracted generation in human history. And the results aren't great. Studies show that the more addicted we become to our phone, the more prone we are to depression, anxiety, the less able we are to concentrate at work and sleep at night. We long for connection, and yet the online world promises connection, but it doesn't really give us the deep connection that we're looking for. And then there's the effect on our spiritual lives. The more distracted we are digitally, the more displaced we become spiritually. Uh, unless you think I'm getting a little bit carried away here, this isn't really a sermon on phones or social media, but what, what I want to get at, it's an important point, is what we think about shapes us. There's powerful forces out there that shape us. And because the brain is so powerful, here's the point I'm trying to make. What we allow to shape our minds is really important. And we've got to make sure that we're deliberate about what we allow to shape our minds because it really, really matters. You might be saying, okay, Daryl, you've been going on a while about social media and phones and everything. What, what are you actually talking about? I am passionate about helping people develop habits that help them grow spiritually. I am passionate about that. A few years ago, I, I looked at some people I respect. By the way, your pastor is one of them. You know, there's some people... Uh, Pastor Derek is like this. I have a number of friends like this. You know when you're with them, you just feel like there's something really attractive about, you, you can't even put your finger on it. You're just like, there's something about you that I really like. And what I've discovered is there's some people I know who have grown spiritually, and they are, it's not like their lives are problem-free. It's not like they're perfect. In fact, they would be the first to tell you, I have so far to go. I am so far from being what I should be. But there's just a humility about them. When you're with them, you feel like, a, a little bit like you've been in the presence of somebody who's, who knows God. And there's a love and a joy and a gentleness about them. Have you experienced this? And it is very attractive, right? And it, a little while ago, I, I began to think, okay, the world is pushing us. I mean, if we, ought to, if we just go with the flow of the world, I know how I'm going to end up. I'm going to listen to angry podcasts and become an angry person. I'm going to get up in the first day, and I'm just going to be at the mercy of my mind's going to be shaped by the forces that are pushing me, social media and whatever else. I'm just going to go that direction. How do I go this direction? How do I go in the way of becoming more alive to God, uh, more gentle? I want to become a gentle person. I want my wife and my kids to look at me and say, I feel safe in your presence. I feel like I can trust myself to you. I don't have to hide myself. I don't have to brace for the blowback of your junk. How do I become more loving? How do I become more alive to God? Well, I've noticed that there's some habits that everybody I know who grows spiritually practices. And over the next three weeks, I want to cover them. And today, I want to cover the first one. And it's really the, the opposite of what I've been talking about so far. It's engaging the Word of God. I really believe that the first, if we want to be on the pathway to becoming that kind of person, a holy person, the first thing that, that we've got to do is we've got to allow our minds to be shaped by the word of God. Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the man. Yeah, by the way, woman, it's, it's man or woman here. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This is not just another psalm, friends. 
This is an invitation for all of us. This is a gateway psalm. You've heard of gateway drugs. There's sort of like the entryway into uh, other drugs. This is like the opposite. This is like a gateway psalm. This is your entryway into a blessed life. This is the front door to living a certain way that will be blessed by God. And blessed by, blessed, I think some of us think of a churchy thing, like, oh, bless you, you know, and you walk away not feeling much different. Blessedness in Scripture is not that. Blessedness in Scripture is a sense of deep well-being, of flourishing in the middle of, of tough times. It is a deep sense of happiness that flows from a sense of rightness and well-being. Well, how do we get this? Psalm 1 tells us, here's the first thing that it tells us, avoid what's opposed to God. That's the first thing that Psalm 1 tells us. It says, blessed is this kind of person, but then it it says, here's what that blessedness looks like. It looks like avoiding what's opposed to God. Verse 1 gives us a progression, and it's very realistic about how evil works. Blessed is the man, the woman who, and notice the verb here, walks not in the counsel of the wicked, who stands, not, does not stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. I like this progression. There's first we walk. You know, we're walking along and there's this stuff that's like, would you like to participate in this? And we're like, no, I don't think so. Like, it, it doesn't look like it's gonna be that helpful for me. But you know what? Maybe a little bit won't hurt, so maybe I'll, I'll, maybe just a little bit. So we walk, right? We're walking by something that pulls us away from God. Well, then we stand, right? We're like, you know what? I've been walking a little, it's not so bad. Like, maybe I can dip my toe in a bit deeper. And before we know it, we're actually sitting in the middle of evil, and we're like, how do we get here? How do we get all the way from, this is evil, it's not going to help me, it's going to pull me away from God, to like, it's not so bad, to actually we end up living there, We make our home there. We're comfortable there. It's a progression. And the psalm is so realistic about this. We need to be careful about what's influencing us, and we need to avoid what's pulling us away from God. And I I like, as well, the realism of of what he describes here. He says, uh, three degrees of separation, wicked, sinners, and scoffers. You know, the wicked, I, I, I really think there's a progression there as well. It's like there's, there's the wicked, those that are engaging in wrong things, but then you go another level and your identity actually becomes sinner, but then you even go further and become a scoffer, mocking what's good. And the psalmist is realistic. He's, what the psalmist is saying here, and this is so important for all of us, is avoid a gradual drift away from God because of the influences that you let into your life. Avoid a gradual drift away from God based on influences you let in your life. You know, I read a quote last year that shocked me. It was from an old mother of two great saints, and she's famous for uh, raising these, the, her two sons. And she turned to her sons one day and said, let me tell you what sin is for you. Anything that draws you away from God, that is sin for you. And so what she was saying uh, let, let me bring it to today. Is, is that Netflix show sinful for you? You might argue, ah, you know, it's not that bad. The question is, does it draw you away from God? Is it part of this progression of, you know, from standing to, to walking, uh, from walking to standing to sitting? Is, is it drawing you away from God? Does it make you a holier person? Whatever it is that draws you away from God is sin for you. Friends, we've seen this over the past year, haven't we? The media that we let into our brains is going to shape how we see the world. And it's going to determine whether we become closer to God. The podcasts that you listen to are going to form your worldview. And they're going to make enemies of certain people. You're going to be taking in some podcasts and it's going to make you hate people. The relationships that you let into your life. The influences, the social media accounts that you follow are all going to determine whether you become closer to God or whether you are undergoing this gradual drift away from God. You'll begin to adopt the way that they think and you'll be, it will shape your life without you even realizing it. 
Question for you, what influences are you allowing in your lives right now that are opposed to God? We tend to think that we can control the results, that we can let them in, but then control uh, our minds. But the psalmist here says, no, you can't. Be careful. Take this seriously. Your walk with God depends on it. Second thing that this psalm teaches us on how to become that kind of person that we want to be, delight in and meditate on God's word. Avoid the negative influences, but here's the positive. Delight and meditate on God's word. Verse 2 says this, but his delight. I love that. Not his drudgery, not his this isn't eating spinach. This is his delight. He loves, by the way, I like spinach. But I'm talking about, like, this isn't something that, like, I have to do it. His delight, he loves this. Her delight is the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. What influence should we allow in our lives? Well, the psalmist tells us, pay careful, diligent attention to God's word. God's word here it's the law. I think it could refer, strictly speaking, to the Torah, to the, the first five books of the Bible. But generally speaking, I think what the psalmist is referring to is, but when he speaks of the law, he's referring to God's word in general, saying, there is a way to live that so delights in this, that it is like, man, this is honey to me. This is like amazing. This is, this is what I want to think about. This is the main influence in my life. And what he's talking about isn't just reading it quickly, you know, doing the Bible reading for the day and then shutting it and then going on with your day. What he's talking about is a way of, of engaging with Scripture that it becomes the dominant influence of your life. Theologian Don Carson puts it this way. You wake up in the middle of the night and your mind is so full of Scripture that it revolves around what God has declared. You think in those terms and when you see squabbles developing in the church, disputes about how things should be done, you naturally ask yourself, what does Scripture say? I wonder what God says on this. Is there some part of the Bible that I need to read again here? He meditates on it day or night. Well, is that hyperbole? I mean, some of you might be thinking, I've got work to do, right? <laughs> I'm paid to be an accountant or a teacher or a lawyer or whatever it is. Like, there's no way I can meditate on God's word day and night. It's actually a literary term. It's called a mirism. And, and we know this, right? If you're in love with somebody, you might tell them, like, man, I think about you day and night. And what you mean by that isn't that that's the only thing you think about. What you're saying by that is, like, my, you are never far from my thoughts. Like, my whole life, I'm never more than just like a short distance away from thinking about you. I'm, I'm, every time my mind drifts, I come back to you. That's what David's talking about. That's what the psalmist is talking about. He's talking about a way of life where we're never far from thinking about Scripture, that our whole lives are full of thinking about it. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the Word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I've seen this silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so we ought to do with the word of God, not crawling over its surface, but eating right into it until we've taken it into our inmost parts. It's idle merely to let the eye glance over words or recollect the poetical expressions or the historic facts. It is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scriptural, scriptural models. And better still, your spirit is flavored with the word of God. Friends, I've met people like that. He uses the illustration of a, a preacher in his day, uh, Spurgeon's day. And Spurgeon says, uh, why this man is a living Bible. Like you prick his skin and the blood that comes out is full of Bible. Like, this guy is so full of Bible that even his blood is, is bleeds Bible. He says, he can't speak without quoting a text. His very soul is full of the word of God. And then Spurgeon says, I commend this example to you, brothers. If you want a, an example, I can just tell you, I've got a friend. 
My friend is wise. I just uh, talked to him this week. Uh, once a month, I, sp- I spend an hour with him on the phone. Whenever, whenever I get off the phone with this guy, I'm like, he's just so full of wisdom. He's one of the guys that I talked about, just so full of, like there's something attractive and joyful and gentle and godly about him. Whenever I talk to him, quite often I'll, I'll ask him advice and I'm amazed at how often his, his wisdom is just like exactly what I needed to hear. And he said, he told me one day, I was talking to him about that. I just recognized that in his life. And he said, it's interesting. A lot of people ask me, how did you get so wise? And he says, I have no idea really. But he says, I'll tell you one thing that I do. I've made it my project to memorize the book of Proverbs. Now, I hate him for the next thing he said. He went on to say in Japanese. So I was like, okay, like we're done. Like. But he says, you know, when people ask me for advice in their life, because I spend so much time, like basically you prick his blood and he's full of scripture and especially the book of Proverbs. When you prick his, his arm, Proverbs comes out. And he's able to think biblically in biblical categories about all the details of the nitty-gritty of life. That's, I think, what the psalmist is talking about, of gradually building a life where this and, and me becomes indivisible. It's like I eat a little bit of this every day. And I, as Spurgeon said, like the silkworm, eventually you can't tell the difference between this and me. It's like this becomes part of me. I eat it. I delight in it. This shapes my thinking. This, I might have a Facebook account, I might have a whatever, Insta, but this is not shaping me. This is shaping me. This is making me who I am. Friends, I want you to hear this. Whatever shapes your thinking shapes your life. So make God's word the primary influence on your life by meditating on it. Again, Whatever shapes your thinking shapes your life. So make God's word your primary influence by meditating on it. And what are the results of this? The psalm paints a beautiful picture in verse 3. It's the next thing we need to see. Here are the results of, of living this kind of life. And by the way, it's not what you think, right? You might think, well, what does a person who is so full of the word of God look like? Is it just like a walking uh, holy, like, rigid, ugly person. Well, no, it's, it's actually what I talked about earlier. It's attractive. It's life-giving. It's, it makes somebody come alive. Verses three to six, he or she is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season that, and its leaf does not wither. The psalmist says it's life. It's flourishing. It's green. It's It's beautiful. In all that he does, he prospers. And then in contrast, what does it look like if we don't live like this? The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away, like it's gone, nothing to it, no substance. Might be a lot of noise, it might be a lot of, uh, might be even a lot of quantity, but there's nothing there. It's just like, it's gone. Nothing substantial, nothing valuable, nothing lasting. And then verses five and six, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Friends, the results couldn't be greater. There's, as I said, this is an invitation to a certain way of life. And the psalmist gives us, okay, you've got option A. You can go along with the world's direction. You can can walk and then stand and then sit, and your life will become like chaff. The Lord will not know you. You'll just go along. There'll be nothing lasting in your life, nothing valuable. Or you can make this your life. You can make this a dominant force of your life. You can absorb it. You can have it shape your mind and become a fruitful tree who exudes life. People see your life and say there's something different about him or her. And not only that, their end result, and this is even the best part, the end result If you notice in verse 6, the Lord will know you. You will know the Lord, and the Lord will know you. You will experience being known, loved, and cared for by God. Friends, two ways to live, not three. There's no neutral option. Which one will it be for you? 
Here's your invitation to really live. I want to get practical in the remaining time that I have here. What steps can we actually take to do this? I know that we're busy. I'm not asking you to give up your phones. Uh, I, I haven't. I'm not asking you to become like a, a monk and sequester yourself. And uh, I know we have to live ordinary life. I know that some of you have kids. Some of you I, I just admire so much for the load that you're carrying. What does this actually look like in reality? Well, let me just give you three things and then I'm done. Number one, please just get started. Just get started. This is the hardest thing. Statistics show that most of us will take this home today and we'll put it on the shelf and we'll pick it up next week and not touch it. Majority of us in the church, this will, we believe this. Probably you believe everything that I've said today, but statistics show that most of us will basically put this down and forget about it this week. Friends, just get started. Today is October the 17th, 2021. For, just make a commitment from this day on, imperfectly but consistently, you will just get started in absorbing this into your life. And it's simpler than we think, by the way. I mean, just get a good Bible. It, your pastors here can help you splurge. Like, this is going to be the rest of your life. It might, however long that's going to be, because the Word of God is so valuable, just say, I'm going to blow the bundle uh, like, for Christmas, I want a really good study Bible that's going to help me understand the Word of God. If you're an auditory listener, if you're a commuter, get a good audio Bible. The radio is fine. Podcasts are fine. I love podcasts. But man, a lot of us, our commutes would be way better if we found a really good audio Bible. And on the way to work, we just took in God's Word and delighted in God's word. Just get started. Did you know that it only takes 15 minutes a day to read through scripture over an entire year? 15 minutes a day. If you want to read the Bible over two years, seven to eight minutes a day is all that it takes. And by the way, it will be hard. Uh, scripture isn't always easy. We've all done this, right? A lot of us have done this. We've started in Genesis and gotten to Leviticus and Numbers and we've given up, it's going to be hard. Just get started. And when you fail, keep going. David Mathis said this, at the end of the day, there's no replacement for finding a time and place, blocking out distractions, putting your nose in the text, and letting your mind and heart be led and captured and thrilled by God himself communicating in his objective written words. By the way, don't give up. You're going to not do this perfectly. You're going to miss a day. I find a lot of people say, well, man, I've missed a day. I had a Bible reading program, like, I, I might have gone it for eight days, and I missed day nine, I may as well quit. No, just keep going. Just commit for the rest of your life that you will, I love Spurgeon's idea here, that you will be like that silkworm eating and absorbing and delighting in this book. Just get started today. Another action step I want to recommend to you and by the way, as you hear this, this isn't the 11th commandment. If you don't like this, don't do it. I've just found it really helpful. Don't make this legalistic. Scripture before a phone. What's the first thing that you did today? Most of us, first thing we did is, is we went on this. And there's nothing, as I say, there's nothing, you weren't sinning when you did that. It wasn't. But James Earl Whitney in his book, The Common Rule, says this. What is it if, as a declaration of priority, we put this first in our day? He writes, refusing to check the phone until after reading a passage of scripture is a way of replacing the question, what do I need to do today? Or what did somebody tweet about today? With a better one, who am I and who am I becoming today? We have no stable identity outside of Jesus. Daily immersion in the scriptures resists the anxiety of emails the anger of news and the envy of social media. Instead, it forms us daily in our true identity as children of the King, dearly loved. Friends, when we open the Word of God, a couple things happen. First, we meet Jesus. You, do you realize all of Scripture is about Jesus? Jesus said that about himself. When we open the Word of God, I mean, how, what could we do that's better at the beginning of the day than to say, I would love to meet Jesus? 
I want to begin the day with seeing Jesus in all his beauty and glory. I want to see the, uh, his love that caused him to die for me. I want to see his relentless pursuit of unholy people. Because like, man, I'm going to mess up today. I need to be in the word of God to realize that Jesus is committed to me. That he went chasing after, uh, I mean, God just was relentless in his love for an imperfect people. The other thing that happens, friends, is you know what happens when we open the word of God? And we, we might have a hard time. The Holy Spirit promises to help us. What better thing in the morning than to say, like, man, I want to open God's very word and see Jesus. I want to meet Jesus. And I want the Holy Spirit to come alongside and guide me in pursuing him. God is more ready to meet us than we are to meet him. What if we just said, every day, I'm going to make this priority before the phone. I'm going to do this before anything else. Final, and there's lots more I could say, but final just practical tip is this. Don't just read, but process what you read. Again, uh, think about, I, I used to have a dog. We'd give this dog a bone. You know, we would eat all the meat on the bone, and then we would give the, the bone to the dog. Now, I, we, were, we didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. Bone splinter, now they say don't do that. But, you know, I, I remember that, bone, that dog would take that bone, and it would spend hours just like every bit of nutrient from that bone, every little last bit of meat or fat or marrow would be gone. And then when it was gone, the dog would give it another going over just in case. What about if we treated scripture like that? What if instead of just reading it every day, what if we chewed over it like a dog chews over a bone? What if we meditated on who God is, on his love for us, on what scripture says about how to live? What if we actually did this? What if we carried it with us, memorizing it, and chewed on it for an extended period of time? What if we put it on the back burner? So that it's like my wife last night put bones on the back burner. Uh, and, you know, it's just there simmering. What if we did that? It's always simmering in our lives. What if we developed the skill of memorizing Scripture, of, of, of becoming so full of Scripture that it actually shaped how we think? Friends, this is the pathway to life. One of my friends says that doing this for a few minutes every day and then making Scripture the dominant influence of your life, just a few minutes a day and then thinking about it all day, there's a snowball effect that accumulates across decades. It's a small action that will produce massive results in our lives. I don't know anybody who's grown spiritually into a mature person, an attractive person, a holy person, who isn't filling themselves regularly with God's word. Whatever shapes your thinking shapes your life. So make God's word your primary shaping influence by meditating on it. This is your invitation, friends. Will you accept God's invitation to become this kind of person? Lord, I want this so badly. It has never been easier to live a shallow life. We can just live life on the surface, bombarded by ads, bombarded by really good shows. But Lord, shows, we don't even have to say we want to watch the next one. It just starts the next one for us. Lord, we've never been more bombarded with great stuff. But a lot of it is is stuff that really doesn't help us know you better and love you more. We want to be shaped by you. We want to get our identity from you. We want to be like trees planted by streams of water, flourishing. Even in the middle of difficulty, we want to know what it's like to prosper because we are dug down deep into you. And so, Lord, please help us to engage your word. Help us to eat your word, to delight in it. Lord, help us to absorb it, to think about it, so that we become like trees planted by streams of water, producing fruit and season, prospering in all we do. And Lord, in all of this, I pray that we would see Jesus. I pray that all of this would not be for the sake of checking off a box in our lives, 
I pray that all of us would be out of a delight in who you are and what Jesus has done for us. Would you make us this kind of person, these kind of people, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.